I never dress up for these things anymore. I've got shorts on and a blanket underneath if I get cold. So I love I've only to have a shirt on. <laughs> just a shirt. Okay. That had to be very uh, upsetting for art. That was just. <laughs> it, it has been. I'll be hearing from his attorney. <laughs> well, it's interesting. I think we have the most colorful background for those who are watching this on YouTube because we're already beginning. I've got uh, a pretty amazing. Um, um, it's my sound barrier actually the stuff behind me it just uh i work with uh, malcolm again who i told you about he, mm -hmm. he made that for me which is wonderful and um what's that behind you that painting that's a large scale elizabeth murray painting that's beautiful and uh, she was a very prominent new york based artist who unfortunately is now deceased but i'm actually in the kaufman gallery of the Nerman Museum of Contemporary Art. Hmm, nice. And it's, it's one of the big pieces. She became very famous for doing um, paintings that no longer adhered to the square or the rectangular, hmm. but she, she worked with shaped canvases. I love seeing it behind you. It's really pleasant, actually, to have it's, something it's so a visually. spectacular piece. <laughs> yeah, I, can, I can only imagine what it must be like. I have, by the way, Bruce Hartman on today. And thank you very much for taking the time. I, I guess, you know, we've known each other off and on for decades, I guess. It's just a long, a long time, Mark. A long time. <laughs> I remember you used to look different and so did I. <laughs> well, thank God we're still here. <laughs> we're still here. And uh, now you have retired, right? Is that right? From I retired uh, as of January 1st, uh, 2021. Yeah, that was a nice time to get out. <laughs> it really was. After, after the year and a half of quarantine, I thought, you know, I think, I think I'm going to go off and, and hopefully uh do a lot more traveling if we're ever allowed to do that yeah so you retired so you could travel and now you have really basically have been still sitting in kansas in the museum are you in, are, are you in kansas or kansas or in missouri we're, we're actually in kansas we're on the kansas side yeah but you yourself do you live in missouri or do you live in kansas i actually live in kansas you do live in kansas in one of the the old suburbs that's fairly close in is there an advantage, by the way, just curiosity wise, to, to living in Kansas versus Missouri, like tax? There is, or... there is in terms of my pension. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we uh, we paid no income tax on our our pensions that we receive as for, as former Kansas employees if we live in Kansas. Oh, that's a big deal. So that's that's substan that's a substantial reason. So is that so if you left anywhere and went anywhere other place, they start taxing your pension? You'd start paying in whatever state you lived in, um, which means I could go to Arizona where you live and you pay no state income tax, presumably. No, and I, I, Florida. Pay state, I pay state income tax. I pay. Oh, tons OK, of I thought Arizona didn't have that. No, then it's Texas, Nevada, Florida. That's yeah, that's right. Alaska. But I don't want to move to any of those states. <laughs> well, didn't Kansas actually try to do that? They were going to take away the state income tax or do something. Uh, and that didn't work so well. Well, they, they, uh, they, they may have contemplated that. Um, but we went through a, a recent period um, where they decided that people who had set up LLCs mm -hmm. would not pay state income tax. And that was a debacle because yeah. they thought it would be about 100,000 people. But of <laughs> course, as soon as they implemented it, about 250,000 extra people decided they were now LLCs. Mm -hmm. And so we lost, the, the state lost all that revenue and, on, and really uh, was moving towards bankruptcy practically. Um, so that's been reinstated. That was the one. Yeah, that's what I remember. That's I what you're thinking. That, of. that was a governor's move, if I remember. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Is that governor still at, in he, Kansas? 
Um, he moved to Washington, D.C. <laughs> to serve in the Trump administration. OK, he's a lobbyist or something. Yes. OK, that makes all makes that seems <laughs> all correct. Well, I, we have, so far we haven't even touched on art or anything else, really. But I found some interesting <laughs> yeah, things we out. We probably should get off of politics. <laughs> yeah, and all that stuff. Um, but so I've known you for all these years, and I knew you were you were an executive director right there at the mm -hmm. at the museum, correct? Um, yeah. And you did that since 1992, right? Um, I actually uh, returned there. to Kansas City, which is my hometown, in 1990 to take the position of the founding director of the Gallery of Art here on the campus of Johnson County Community College. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we built up a sizable program over many years and did, a, you know, a lot of different exhibitions. And eventually, uh, you know, we decided to build a major contemporary art museum. And we began that process in 2002 and we opened the museum in 2007. And so the Nerman is the largest contemporary art museum in the four state region. Wow. And one of the, um, I'm sitting on the second floor of the museum. Um, those galleries are primarily devoted to the permanent collection. And, uh, you know, one of the, I think, interesting things you found about the museum was that we made a real commitment to collecting contemporary Native American art. And we probably have close to 300 major works now in the collection by contemporary Native American artists. And, and not only Native American, but you have a sizable African American collection, don't you? We, uh, we made a real effort, a decision many decades ago, that we were going to use the collection to emphasize diversity and inclusiveness long before you heard all of the, everyone talking about that. Now it's a, a, a common sort of talking point, but we began this clear back in the uh, early 1990s. And uh, we began showing uh, the work of many contemporary African-American artists, Latino artists, Native American artists. Uh, it ran the gamut. And that's definitely our collection numbers about 2000 works of art now. Mm -hmm. And that's definitely reflected in the permanent collection. How, how do you, man, I mean, cause some of these painters uh, are very expensive. Some of these artists are very expensive. Maybe they weren't when you started, but how do you fund something like that? You know, we've, we've always prided ourselves, Mark, on the fact that what money we had we would spend as judiciously as possible. And, you know, having grown up in a collecting family, uh, my parents began collecting Native American art back in the 1960s, mm. when for most people, Native American art was considered, you know, uh, ethnographic or anthropological. And my parents really embraced it as an art form. But you know, you, you learn to take whatever resources you have and, and maximize the results. And, and we've always applied that to the museum. Uh, obviously, as executive director, uh, one of my jobs was to go out and raise money. And I was really fortunate to getting the support of, uh, you know, a variety of individuals here in the Kansas City area who were willing to support you know, our efforts to build a major contemporary art collection and also uh, to include contemporary Native American art. Was that because of you? Well, um, I think I'm nothing if not enthusiastic, Mark. And a collector. You're <laughs> and a major a collector. collector. Yeah, I mean, that and, makes a big you know, difference. I, I have to say that, you know, um, as, a, as an art historian, as a curator, as a museum director, I found it invaluable that I had grown up in a collecting household because I fully understood the importance of dealers. I understood how to negotiate. Um, I understood- Yes, you have. Often, <laughs> yes, <laughs> as you well know. I do. And, uh, and also, you know, um, you know, not having a fear. I, I, I find some curators um, are almost fearful or distrustful of dealers, auction houses, 
Um, and of course, having grown up in that world, um, you know, I, I had none of that. I was ready to go. And, uh, you know, the other thing is we, we really tried to acquire many works early on in an artist's, uh, you know, career in their trajectory. And I'm actually, the gallery I'm sitting in currently, to my right, is a major painting, Marshall painting, who's, you know, widely considered to be one of the most important contemporary African-American artists. We did an exhibition for Terry in 1995. Wow. And we followed that by purchasing a major painting by him literally picked it out of a show at the Art Institute of Chicago, East Chicago Bays. And we purchased that painting for $12,000. And I know and one of his it was auction just records, recently appraised. One of his auction records sold for 7 million. million. How much? I think 17 million. And with the, with the, well, but also with the, with the, uh, the buyer's fee, and everything it was 20 million dollars yeah 20 million with the buyers yeah. yeah and how so your twelve thousand dollar one was worth what now well we, we just had it appraised for 25 million oh my gosh so that's unbelievable <laughs> my mistake was i didn't buy one for myself or you <laughs> <laughs> wouldn't that but, be a wonderful gift <laughs> you know it's interesting though when you are in those situations First of all, I think your mind is focused on your job. Your job is to get the best you can for the museum and you're not Absolutely. thinking about yourself. Um, and if you start to think about yourself, I think your priorities have changed. Um, and I think that probably went through your mind as you were doing it, whether it was subconscious or conscious that this is, I wanna focus on this. I don't wanna muddle the, the waters with me looking at anything else. Well, actually ethically, um, as, as a curator, as a director, we're not really supposed to collect in the field that the museum collects in. And for me, that was not a problem because I have always continued to collect historic Native American art. Yes. So there was no conflict um, because no, I, I always had to have my mindset that I was acquiring the best possible piece for the museum, right? And and so um, I would I wouldn't have been competing in any way with the museum. Yeah, I mean, I just think it's remarkable too when you think about that one, just that one piece. And I'm sure there's dozens that are that you've done over the years that are equal, maybe not equally, but are or have done extremely well. But from twelve thousand to twenty five million in a period of, you know, what else is that? Maybe 30 years or so, not even 25 years. About 25, 25 years. Yeah, I mean, that, I mean, it was worth it. all the things that you ever did, just that one purchase for the museum in a weird way, not only in the fact of the money, let's just take that off the table, but it's a major mm -hmm. piece, right? It's a major work. It would, it, it would be one of the most important Important works by a, a, an African American artist in our entire region, of all the museums in this region. Mm -hmm. um, our particular painting, Mark, is from a series that Carrie James Marshall did depicting housing projects. Oh yeah, um, in Chicago and one in Los Angeles, both cities he lived in, and there are only five of those. And they're all now in museum collections. Wow. Um, but our painting, I used to get around. We would get so many requests for this painting to travel <laughs> because it's been, it's been sent to Documenta in Germany. It was in the big retrospective that the Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago organized with the Metropolitan Museum in New York and the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. And um, you know, it's been around the globe, and I would say, if only I traveled as much as that painting did, I would have I would have seen the entire planet by now. And and we literally had to make a decision that we were we were really going to restrict its travel. Um, you know, because uh, it was a bit out of control. We were just getting so many requests for it. Well, and I see that too on many levels. One, it's hard on the painting when you do it. 
And two, you know, that's one of the reasons you bought it is so the people in Kansas and in Missouri can come and see it. Yeah. It's an icon for the museum. And so we have a lot of people who visit here and they expect to see that painting. Yeah. I have a painting in my own collection, which you saw, which is Helpless, which is at Chanteau Begay's show in the Wheelwright. And mm -hmm. I think there was like for four years, it was gone. And just every museum, now it's going to be more, you know, wants that painting. Um, and they want to show it. And I try to show it, you know, but I mean, we, there's, you know, soon it could be, you know, 10 years and I won't see it ever. And so it's nice to have those things, even though I do, that is my personal piece. And when I bought that, I knew when I bought that from Shanto, first of all, it hit a chord with me, but it also, I could just, I knew it was an important painting. And I bought that, I don't know, 15 years ago, maybe or even longer. So, you know, for those out there collectors, this is a good lesson, I think, too, is that if you can buy the most important works by an artist that you can afford to do, don't you think? Well, at the time we bought the Carrie James Marshall painting, um, we were getting $15,000 a year from the college for acquisitions, which is not much money to be buying contemporary art or art in general. Right. But, and when I presented to the acquisitions committee, the notion of buying the Carrie James Marshall, someone on that committee said, but my God, that's almost all the money we have. <laughs> and I said, well, it's a question of getting the very best thing, not quantity, yeah. but rather really honing in on what, what you think is the most important work you could potentially acquire at that time for the museum. And, uh, and then we voted unanimously to get it, um, thankfully. Yeah. Yeah, that has to be painful if they don't do that. You know, and I'm sure that does. Well, yeah, I'm sure there have been a few of those over the years that got away. Inevitably, um, the it was interesting. Um, back in 1992, I was approached by Marty and Tony Oppenheimer, who you know, yes. um, who are Los Angeles based uh, philanthropists and collectors. And as we began talking about initially they wanted to form a sculpture collection outdoor park for the college and we embraced that immediately but one of the things that tony oppenheimer brought up at dinner one evening is he said you know if we go to new york city and you say i'm bruce hartman from johnson county community college in overland park kansas he said they will be nonplussed they, they, they won't even know what to say. Yeah. And we're looking at, at major works of art. So he said, the one thing that would ensure that we get people's attention, major dealers, is if the three of us were able to make a decision on the spot, the three of us would form the acquisitions committee for the funds that Marty and Tony would gift. And he said, and then we tell them we can have you a check in two weeks. And, and we began doing that. And so if we bought a Louise Bourgeois for $250,000, they had a check in two weeks. You as a dealer know that that's often not the case. Oh, it's People all, that's like, <laughs> maybe that's that, never maybe the case, people. actually. Yeah, it's never the and case. So that really got the attention of many major dealers um, who oftentimes you know, deal with museums where it, the process is so lengthy to get it through acquisition committees and uh, all sorts of things have to be approved that it could take six or eight months um, with Marty and Tony because they became our primary donors and over the years gifted millions of dollars to the museum. Um, initially, like I say, to, to acquire outdoor sculptures. But in 2003, when we announced the new, new Nerman Museum of Contemporary Art was going to be constructed, they suddenly said, you know what, let's go and start buying paintings, photography, video, works on paper, um, ceramics, et cetera, for the new museum so that you'll have something to put in the museum itself. And so, 
that that changed everything. Yeah, it does because I must say, as a dealer, I have museums that want to buy things, and sometimes it's very difficult to be able to sell to them because, you know, a you may not own the piece and you're selling it for a family or a client or a state, and it may take, like you said, eight months or even you know longer sometimes to get the funds and to get it through and all that, and you have a hundred different people wanting to buy it. So, you know, you're making this decision, do I do it or not? And, uh, you know, so that's a, that's a difficult thing. And also, like you said, in the, these, some of these galleries, galleries you were dealing with, you know, they want it, they want the pieces to go to museums. They like that. It's good for the artists. It's good for them. It's good for everyone, but, you know, they're going to go Kansas, uh, you know, this, that really, and yeah, you start buying that gets their attention very quickly. Well, and and obviously, once we built and opened the museum in two thousand and seven, and people were able to travel here and and see the museum, um, you know that was a real milestone that changed everything as well. But in those early years, um, by by doing what we did and having a committee that could make a decision on the spot really enabled and empowered us to build a major collection. And the, the Oppenheimers were fearless. I mean, they would take a chance on uh, emerging artists. Um, when we bought our Kehinde Wiley painting, another major African-American artist, yeah. we bought it from, from his apartment where he was painting and living in the uh -huh. same space at that time. Um, I mean, today's a superstar. Yeah, well, and, after he did Obama, that was pretty much <laughs> well, that, that really took it through the roof. But um, he was he was painting our painting. It was leaning against his bed. Yeah. And uh, we that's what artists do, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Even Obama's, I guarantee you, his portrait laid next to the bed at some point. <laughs> <laughs> well. It was interesting with Gandhi because he hadn't even finished the painting yet. He hadn't put the background in. And, and we were able to say, we'll take it. And uh, so many of the things that we've acquired um, uh, just in front of me is a, a monumental Dohosa robe made out of thousands of stainless steel dog tags. It mm -hmm. also is an iconic piece for yes. the museum. And we were at the Armory Show in New York and we saw just kind of a, uh, a shirt size uh, piece by Doho made out of metal dog tags. I had seen at the uh, Whitney Museum, one of these robes that extend out across the floor. Yes, I see. And so we ended up commissioning one of the robes for $80,000. And it took a couple of years that was fabricated in South Korea and, uh, and then delivered here. But it, I mean, we couldn't begin to afford that today. It would be in the millions of dollars. Yeah. And so those risks paid off. Now, that isn't to say that everything that we acquired um, gained in great value or anything, but you've really got to be discriminating, discerning, and, and know the field. And, um, you know, that's, that's the same way that... Uh, uh, initially, my parents approached collecting Native American art, and and that certainly is is true of how we collected for the museum. And how did Mark Bradford get away? That's one of the ones that got away. I mean, he's he's the, my all time favorite. So his his prices rose so quickly. <laughs> as you know. Um, he was actually our first Jerome Nerman. Our museum is named for Jerry Nerman, um, who made his fortune selling used semi trucks. Um, he built the largest used semi truck uh, sales business in the United States with 19 different branches around the country. And he was collecting uh, contemporary art. Um, but anyway, we invited Mark Bradford to be our first uh, Jerome Nerman speaker at the museum uh, over a decade ago. And I don't know if you've ever met him. He's just the, the most terrific human being. Is he like six, and, seven? Uh, <laughs> oh my, yes. I mean, and I'm not tall. I'm, yeah. I'm about <laughs> five, eight and shrinking. 
Right. And <laughs> anyway, he just towered over me. But uh, he was a brilliant speaker. But the price of his paintings, we we desperately wanted to get one. But I think by the time we were looking at them, they were around a hundred thousand. And then very quickly thereafter, they were 250, 500,000, and then on into the million dollars. Yeah, the, it's things like that. It's, it's frustrating. I'm sure it's very frustrating for you in the position you have him there lecturing and talking early on. You recognize his brilliance, and you know, you can't get enough money to get the piece. And, and, and we may very well have spent all of our funds for that year. And by the time that got replenished, they were too expensive for us, <laughs> uh, but he is definitely one that got away. You know. <laughs> well, now you have to get a Malcolm Mosley who's there in Kansas City. <laughs> <laughs> there get you one, go. Get one for your collection way before he. As, as you know, we're always looking. <laughs> um, Shout out and, to Malcolm. Now, do you, you know, have you gone to the big art fairs like Art Basel, Miami, and that sort of thing, Mark? Yeah. You know, I've gone to some in New York. I haven't gone to the Art Basel. I was going to go the other 2019 and couldn't make it happen. Um, but I have well, gone. And then COVID came on. Yes. Uh, and they are amazing. I actually find them um, a little bit overwhelming, quite frankly. Um, there's so much color and light and different things that it's very interesting. It wears me out pretty quickly. Um, it's, it's so funny because people have one of two reactions. They either have your reaction where they find it a bit exhausting and overwhelming or in my case and certainly marty oppenheimer's case you're enervated you're energized by it and tony oppenheimer um at a certain point will just say you know i've, I've just got to go sit down somewhere <laughs> Yeah, I'm on I'm on visual overload. Well, that's Marty right. and I, however, we would just plow through. We <laughs> would keep going. We'd be there all night if they'd let us stay. And uh, and I'm the type of person that I just love looking. And um, and you know, uh, as as you know, it's always um, a, 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 an issue of comparison. And the more you see the better you are able to compare yes. one work of art to another. And certainly if you're looking at a, a Tony Day pot, if you've looked at hundreds of them and you have that mental record, that visual record, you're able to make a much more informed decision about whether this is the Tony Day pot that you think is one of the best and the right piece for you. Yes. And so I, I love those shows. I, um, I, I almost feed off of them in that regard. Yeah, I like, I do like them. I do find them sometimes. It's interesting uh, when I've gone to these that some of the pieces that I'm interested in, I find it hard for the people selling it often just ignore me, honestly. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, believe me, you're not and alone. I'm serious. I'm a serious person. You're not alone. Seriously, <laughs> you know, a, a lot of major dealers. As you know, they are they are scanning that crowd. They yes. are watching everyone come up and down those aisles, looking for many of the better known collectors, right. um, people of great wealth, and and that they know they may be able to, to place a piece with. And I think particularly in the first few days, Mark, um, when the dealers are trying to make back their booth rental, and and the enormous cost that some of those shows entail uh in terms of booth rental shipping staffing right um all of that they're they're really thinking who is the most likely buyer and uh if you and i walk down now they may not grab us uh over an eli road or something mean, well, and i understand that but they may not even talk to us <laughs> well, that's that's the thing that right. kind of shocked me that when, you know, yeah. making an inquiry about it, you know, I'm, and it's a, a, an important piece and having to force them to give me information. Right. And it just varies from dealer to dealer. I've always enjoyed going on the, I mean, we would always go for the VIP openings. Yeah. There are fewer people at those yeah. and that sort of thing. 
And then we would go throughout the, the week that they're on. But I always loved going that last day. Um, oftentimes it might be on a Monday because at that point, people, dealers had already made their sales theoretically, or they weren't going to make the sales right. and they had resigned themselves to that. Right. But, but the crowds really had thinned out. Um, you know, those big art fairs have become almost a, an entertainment event in the cities. They're a spectacle. And so you end up on Saturday and Sunday with just the general public pouring in. And it's it's hard to even get up and down the aisles. Um, you know, they did do the Armory show again this, this year. Um, in fact, it was just this past weekend. And um, it sounds like um, the crowds came back and that dealers did very well. Um, so that's encouraging. Um, and I don't know what will happen. Uh, I think they're planning on Art Basel in Switzerland. I don't know if Miami will take place this year, um, but but uh, sure I, I'd love to get back <laughs> down there and just throw myself in the middle of it. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, you do. You, you have to try to continue to get your VIP status early entry. <laughs> <laughs> well, hope knock on wood, I can swing that. <laughs> <laughs> you probably can. <laughs> Um, though, yeah, I was going to say that one time I was in it as a VIP entry and they still ignored me, <laughs> which is like, okay. And, and, a, and a, a museum director, I won't say who it was, who used to work in that field said, we know everyone. He said, we know everyone. So if they don't know you, they're just going to ignore me. Yeah. I can say in the Western and Native American world, we do not do that. No, you would, you would get the, everyone's attention. Yes. Yes. Not to say that if some great client came in that has been supporting me for decades or whatever, uh, I'm not going to give them a great deal of attention, um, which I would. I'm sure I would. That's just normal. But I'm not going to ignore anybody. That's for sure. Because you just don't know. Well, you know, it's, it's interesting, Mark, because having grown up in the field, um, it, it was fascinating to eventually you figure out that there are all these different art worlds you know there's the contemporary art world um which is sort of an entity unto itself there's the you know impressionist old master art world there is the native american art world the western art world um you know there for many years um um mediums like silversmithing textiles ceramics form their own kind of world of influence. And, and you know, they would have the so-called craft fairs or shows um, called SOFA yeah, up in Chicago. Right. Yeah, they're fantastic. Yeah, and, and so there are all these different entities um, that are operating all at the same time. And periodically they, they cross paths or interface and I think that's increasingly more so um, as museums come and collectors come to embrace um, broader, you know, art constituencies and, and broader ranges of artists. I mean, it's, it's one of the things, Mark, that when we made the decision um, to really pursue forming a major contemporary Native American art collection for the Nermit, you know, we had to sit back and think about the fact that that inevitably meant that we would be collecting textiles, beadwork, uh, pottery, jewelry, um, just the whole gamut, um, which uh, many contemporary art museums don't do. Right. And it would be, to most contemporary art curators, if, if you were to show them a Jamie Okuma uh beaded oh. piece they, they they'd be not they wouldn't even know how to respond <laughs> right <laughs> um but you know it's it's interesting uh we looked at it from the standpoint if weaving is a primary form of artistic expro expression for the Navajo people then how do you not collect weavings right I mean you've got to if silversmithing is a primary form of expression, pottery, you know, it runs the gamut. 
And it's been fascinating as we built this collection, Mark, many of the pieces that we get the most requests for loans from other major museums are now the contemporary Native American pieces. Mm. You know, yeah. I had mentioned how we get all these requests for the Kerry James Marshall. Um, that's, that's an obvious one. But right now, um, our, our major Grace Chino Acoma pot uh, is on loan to Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art for a show that they recently curated that's traveling. Um, you know, our Terry Greaves beaded high heel sneakers are going off to the Tacoma Art Museum and then on to Amsterdam for a traveling show. And um, we've got a Marilou Schultz weaving Navajo um, that she based on a computer chip. And to my knowledge, there are only two of those. The first one, was one that was commissioned by Intel Corporation down in Albuquerque. Um, but we loaned ours to Documenta in Germany a few years ago. And, um, you know, the, the curator was doing an exhibition that was addressing how technology has impacted contemporary Native artists. And it, I got to say, it's been really rewarding to see all these museums suddenly contacting us and saying, would you loan uh, the Terry Greaves? Would you loan this Navajo textile? Um, that, 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 you know, that to see those walls break down um, to where, you know, there is real inclusiveness. Um, but, you know, uh, for the longest time, I can only imagine that, that some contemporary curators probably thought, what are what in the world are they doing out there? <laughs> you know, <laughs> buying Acoma pots and various things at a at a major contemporary art museum. Do you have a Marlo Catoni Navajo? Um uh, don't have. Yeah, he's fantastic. He's an amazing individual. Yeah. I and love and painter. He's also an extremely good painter. So. I'd love to get a well, actually we did get a Calvin Tony this year. And I don't know if you know him. Yeah. But I just think he's brilliant, and and we were we were able to get one just prior to my retirement, and I have to I have to share with you, Mark, and your your viewers. Um, in retirement, one of the most frustrating things is for thirty years I was spending other people's money <laughs> and funds that were raised. Now I go so in a gallery and I think, oh, I'd love to buy that for the museum. But I can't do that any longer. <laughs> no. <laughs> now I would have to spend my own money. <laughs> yeah, that, you. yeah, that hurts more, doesn't it? As you know. <laughs> that, my writing the check is more problematic. <laughs> <laughs> do you, uh, does the uh, museum have a TC Cannon, by the way? We we do not have. Yeah. Um, That's what these are behind me, by the way. The drawings? Yeah, those are all is. I, I do in my personal collection, um, but uh, we were way too late to get a painting by him. Yeah. Um, they're of such value now. There's so and, few there's just so few of them as well. There's so few of them that are not in museums already. And, uh, you know, when I saw his show that traveled recently that was down at the... Uh, I think it was at the the Gilcrease actually, yeah. where I saw it. And maybe that was a show that the Peabody originated. Was that Denver and Phoenix? I know that. I saw it. Well, I went through that show and I just thought, if only I could have acquired one of these for the Nerman. Fortunately, Crystal Bridges, which is just three hours south of us, did acquire a major one. Oh, nice. So at least there's one in the region. Yeah, let's talk about Crystal Bridges since it's we're on it. Um, <clears throat> Alice Walton's done an amazing job, hasn't she? I mean, I find that to be one of the great museums in America. I mean, period. Uh, and she has museum. built that from scratch yeah. in the last decade. They're just celebrating their 10th anniversary. It's unbelievable. That's 10 it years. It really is. I mean, they have such a, a significant American painting collection and the building is, a, is remarkable and it's all free. And now they're going to expand. They're going to add an additional 
hundred thousand square feet yeah, to amazing. what's already there. And my hat is off to her. What she has accomplished is is truly phenomenal. And there were so many people who were naysayers about what she was attempting um, many years ago. And now you've got the Washington Post writing it up, saying it is the most woke museum in America, Mm -hmm. that they're doing the most um, adventuresome and inclusive programming. And and that includes in their collecting. And um, as you know, they recently begun acquiring Native American art. And so, and their philosophy is really to integrate that work into the galleries with all of the work that they from you know all the other art forms that they have i love it like i love them doing that i think that's important honestly i agree and and it's you know we're fortunate here in kansas city the nelson atkins museum has a major commitment to native american art their commitment focuses more on historic masterpieces but that just means that the collection we have built here at the Nerman is a terrific complement to what the Nelson has. So that anybody visiting Kansas City can come here and see, let's say, 230 major pieces at the Nelson. Uh, probably 80% are historic, but they can come out to the Nerman. And also, we have a program of installing art all across our campus. So there are corridors that you can walk down where there are, you know, 50 major contemporary Native American works on permanent view. They're all protected, you know, under plexiglass and with security Mm -hmm. cameras. But they can see several hundred contemporary Native American works on our campus. So it really makes Kansas City a destination point. But I think that, like with the Nelson, at least the American art is on the second floor and you flow seamlessly from American art into American Indian art. But as we're talking about at Crystal Bridges, um, you may be looking at a George Caleb Bingham painting and look over and see uh, a case with a Blackfoot tobacco bag and a parflesh envelope uh, in a case right adjacent to it. And they literally try to curate those galleries so that the Native American work makes sense within the context of other works within that gallery. And I think they're committed to that. And are they putting historic work as well, Native works? They, um, their, their first major acquisition Um, They actually approached me about three, four years ago and asked me if I would loan six. My primary collection are are Native American paintings. Right. And the first Native American work of art I ever bought, I was probably 13 years old, and I was at the intertribal ceremonials in Gallup, New Mexico with my father. And I saw this big B8 Yaz painting of eagles attacking deer. Mm-hmm. And I thought it was the greatest thing I'd ever seen. <laughs> he is I was pretty re- good. <laughs> I was reacting like a 13 year old boy. Right. Yeah. And uh, anyway, I bought that painting for myself. And we schlepped it home, uh, you know, in, in the vehicle and everything. My father was looking at baskets primarily. Um, I remember he bought a great Atu basket um, that uh, Doug Allard had. Um, and and Doug literally opened up a Quaker Oats canister and turned it upside down and this Atu basket fell out. <laughs> and he said that this couple had owned two and they kept them stored in that Quaker Oats canister. <laughs> It's a good and place to store them, actually. They're very fresh. It was actually convenient. They would drop some mothballs in there to keep insects out of them. And so I remember he bought that. I bought the Beat and Yaz painting. And that launched me on, uh, you know, collecting these paintings over the past, you know, over 50 years. And, uh, you know, Crystal Bridges asked me, would you loan six paintings? And they said, 
we would love to incorporate them in our modernist galleries. And I was thrilled because I, I've always felt like Native American paintings, and I'm talking about whether they're Plains or Navajo or Pueblo, um, in a way we're a stepchild of the Native American art world. Um, so many people somewhat dismissed them um, they, for a variety of reasons. And all of a sudden here was Crystal Bridges saying, would you loan us these? We'd like to have six because we're going to need to rotate them because of conservation reasons, you know, exposure to light. And in most of these paintings, the historic ones are certainly works on paper, but they were gonna hang them right in the modernist galleries. And they hung a Quincy Tahoma painting and an Awatsira painting. Um, actually it was a pop chili. They hung a pop chili and a Quincy Tahoma painting in their first installation. And you can only imagine I beat a path down there as soon as possible because, and, and I entered that gallery with some trepidation. I'm sure. Because I thought, you know, when you hang these paintings next to a major George O'Keefe, an Arthur Dove, right. um, an Edward Hopper, you're talking big competition, um, the best of the best. And I thought, you know, they're either going to hold their own or it's not going to work. And I walked into that gallery and they looked spectacular. And they absolutely held their own with all the other modernist works in that space. And I made the decision, Mark, that I would just stand back. Um, and I kind of backed into a corner. I'm sure the guard thought I was, you know, casing the gallery <laughs> or something. But uh, I wanted to watch people and see what their reaction is. Whether they really, because we all know that the average museum goer spends about three to four seconds looking at a painting, even right. if it's a Van Gogh. That's true. And I stood there and I watched family after family, individuals come through. And, you know, it was funny. They might walk by the O'Keefe. They would stop at these Native American paintings and really study them. And, and I think it was something that was unfamiliar to them. And, um, uh, you know, they had the labels up and everything but it was a surprise, it was unexpected. And they were so well received. And I know, you know, to Alice Walton's credit, she asked their curator there, she said, why aren't we collecting these? And the curator said, we can. <laughs> <laughs> Very easily, actually. And they, they, well, and, and so they came to me a few years later and they said, would you sell us 31 paintings from your collection. Well, at the time I had about 200. And so it was fairly easy for me <laughs> to, you know, put together, they, they, I worked with them. We put together a grouping of 31. And fortunately I had most of the major artists represented by three to five major works each. Um, and we put together this collection and Alice Walton acquired it for the, for Crystal Bridges. And, and I was thrilled because um, so many of these artists died young, perhaps led tragic lives. Um, you know, I look at Gerald Naylor who did such beautiful yeah. paintings, but died at 36, was murdered while he was trying to save a woman's life mm. um, who was being beaten to death by her husband. And, um, and it's tragic. And he was a brilliant artist. And so, you know, to see those works enter a major American art collection, to suddenly be recognized within the canon of American art history was, was enormously gratifying. Now that doesn't mean that it wasn't somewhat painful to part with them. <laughs> because I'm nothing if not a collector. <laughs> and so, you know, you do go through the divorce process yeah, sure. <laughs> of having to separate from them. But um, it was it was fantastic to see them on view in that in that context, in that setting. 
Um, I will never forget, I was standing looking at one of them. Uh, I was serving on a panel for a contemporary Native American art show that Crystal Bridges was organizing and Tony Abeda was serving on it, a well-known uh, contemporary Native American artist. And uh, um, I had decided to kind of stand back once again, watch people looking at them. And unbeknownst to me, Tony had entered the gallery and he walked up and he said, are you admiring your paintings? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, as a matter of fact, yes. <laughs> but I said, I really enjoy seeing how people respond to them. And I said, you know, Tony, uh, I wish that these artists could see their work on view in this kind of extraordinary architecture, this setting with these major American artists. Um, I said, they probably never dreamed that there would come a day um, when that would happen. And Tony looked at me and he said, they know Bruce. And I lost it. <laughs> I get emotional just telling it. Yeah. Um, because again, we're we're all only caretakers. Right. The, the objects, the works of art, theoretically will outlive us. And they have a life of their own. And so to see those works placed there was was so wonderful. Yeah. Now, subsequent to that, Mark, I then, I also gifted some historic pieces from my personal collection, and hence they do have several wonderful parflesh envelopes, the Blackfoot tobacco bag, a big Ojibwe uh, bandolier bag, and some other pieces like that. Um, um, to, I gifted them one of the greatest Zuni frog pots I've ever seen that actually a woman left me in her will many years ago. Her that was on the was uh, cover. That was a, you had it next to you on the cover of Art um, in 2000. Art News. Yeah, right. Yes. I saw it, it sitting there on the table. table. <laughs> How about yeah, that? I paid attention to that little frog pod. Because <laughs> you were looking for the Native American art. <laughs> you were ignoring that Polly Applebaum or the Philip Gustin and all that. Yeah, they're just as but, good. Um, you know, they're there's great. Good, but, yeah, the you know, Pot's um, just as good as Augustine. And I love his work. Well, you know, I, I have always looked at Native American art. And if I was buying a basket or a squash blossom necklace, I would think if I put this in the room filled with Matisse's at the Museum of Modern Art, would it hold its own? And, and to a degree, that became my criteria for acquiring pieces was, you know, if you put it in a gallery filled with, you know, uh, unabashed masterworks, is this still going to command your attention? Is it going to resonate? And, um, you know, uh, those historic pieces look fantastic down there at Crystal Bridges. And I think it opens many people's eyes um, to, you know, what is really America's original art. Yeah, well, you look at the Barnes collection in Philadelphia. I mean, he does that. He did that very thing, including putting things next and to I, pieces. <laughs> and, I, and I love the fact that they had to install it the way he had it in his home originally. Yeah, they needed so to. you get you get a Matisse with a big Navajo serape, um, with a, a concho belt, and then hanging. He put nails in the edges of the frames. And he would hang like medieval locks on them. <laughs> <laughs> I could go down that path with a heartbeat, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> well, I agree with if you I had on those all, resources. <laughs> and all of those, that great uh, native art, you know, historic art, it holds its own just Absolutely. fine against modern art, against any of it. It's just, I mean, it's in some in some fashions, I think it's more creative. You know, considering the conditions really? that often these were had to be made in, you know, uh, you know, whether it's a great Serapi being done outside, you know, under harsh conditions with little food and, and, and no money to speak of, yet making unbelievable masterpieces for themselves. Exactly. Yeah. You look at the, at the living conditions. I mean, I think about the, uh, the Panamint basket makers out there. 
in, in a, the most extreme circumstances. And, and they would weave these extraordinary, breathtaking baskets. And take over and a year. So, yeah, so beautifully woven. And, you know, that work absolutely holds its own. Oh, yeah. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, because my parents got into the field early, uh, well, relatively early in the 60s, um, you know, it's been fantastic to watch the transition, to see the appreciation grow among art historians and uh, art museums. And suddenly watch the Native American art come up from the basement up into the proper galleries, right. you know. I've never forgotten, I was at, I won't even name the museum, but it was a major one on the East Coast. And this has been many years ago. And of course, I was, I was notorious. I'd go into a major art museum and I'd say, where's the Native American art? And I can't tell you how many times I would hear, oh, it's, it's on the lower level between the men and women's restrooms. And I'd go down and that was the space that they had committed to it. And I would just cringe. Um, but, you know, they, 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 it was a different world then. And, um, you know, fortunately, and I think to a great extent because of collectors, um, you know, bringing it to the attention of museum curators and, and, and of course, prices going up. I remember uh, we bid in the original green auction oh, wow. back in like 1974 at Sotheby's yes, that's right. and acquired a few pieces out of that auction. But the the most expensive Dotsalali basket went for, I think, $6,100. Yeah. And it was actually purchased by a woman here in Kansas City um, by the name of Mary Myra. And, and she and my father were very competitive about their collecting habits. <laughs> and she got that Dotsalali. And uh, uh, the New York Times had this article the next day. And the article was all about, this just shows how people have lost their minds. <laughs> um, that anyone would pay $6,100 for a basket. Yeah, which is worth a million dollars now. Oh, easily or more. Yeah. Or um, that ironically, basket it would be. Ironically, years later, my mother and I were flying down to the McCormick auction in Scottsdale. And we got off the, the as we were getting off the airplane at the Phoenix airport, um, I saw this woman over on the right and she was sitting there with this giant something in a black garbage bag, a plastic garbage bag. And all of a sudden I realized it was, it was Mary Myra. And I said, my God, Mary, you know, what are you doing? And she said, Oh, this is the Dotsalali. I sold it to a, a fellow here in Phoenix. It was Jerry Collins. Oh yeah. And, and she said, um, we're just, we're doing the transaction here in the, in the parking lot of the airport. And then I'm just going to get on a plane and fly back to Kansas City. <laughs> <laughs> and I told my father that the next day. And he was, he was bereft. He was beside himself because uh -huh. he had wanted and had tried to buy that basket uh -huh. from her. Uh -huh. um, but, you know, another one that got away. I do, occasionally I do. Well, this, I think this is a good transition point, actually, because I want to find out the backstory of how you got so interested uh, in Native American art and where you grew up. And uh, clearly, you had parents that were very, very influential. So where did you grow up?